This is in news at 7 p.m. We're live from Johannesburg. I'm Gordon Gambi. These are your headlines. A senior Herikwala district municipality official has been arrested for the murder of former ANC Youth League lead lead leader Cindy Somagak. Picking up the pieces, a preliminary report by local government has outlined the estimated damage by floods in Guazul Natal at over 100 million rand. We begin here. A high-profile KZN ANC politician has been arrested in connection with the 2017 murder of former ANC Youth League Secretary General Cindy Somakaka. He is expected to appear in court within the next 48 hours. Wazul Natal ANC Secretary Mtumsen Nduli says the provincial leadership will deliberate on the latest development at its meeting tomorrow. We are meeting tomorrow as, as, a, as a Monday is an empty day where the top leadership in the province and throughout the country is the case where we meet and, uh, and discuss a variety of issues. I'm quite certain that the provincial leadership uh, will reflect on this matter in order to guide the organization, but also uh, to give our own approach to society in terms of how we want to navigate the current uh, circumstances. What I must say to you that it's very difficult to be concrete about what actions could be taken when we are not yet sure whether there has been charges preferred against the comrade or else he has been taken in for questioning. South Africans are, are in the dark for a third day. ESCOM says stage four load shedding will continue until 11 o'clock tonight. The parastatal says yesterday's cuts led to a further decline in water reserves used to supplement generation capacity. The power utility says it needs to manage its diesel and water resources in order to ensure reduced load shedding in the coming week. It adds the blackouts are due to loss of capacity. The power utility says this includes lost imports from Mozambique, which have been affected by tropical storm Idai. ESCOM warns that supply from our storm-hit neighbor is unlikely to restore to be restored at any time soon. Uh, many business owners are unhappy about the rolling blackouts, especially those who need a lot of electricity for their daily operation. We actually have some compressors that we need for spray painting. We can't use them. We can't use our lifts as well. Um, actually, our alarm is off as well, so it does become a bit of a security issue as well in terms of the power being off. So um, with these restrictions or the load shedding issue, it actually restricts us a lot in terms of our productivity level. And hence why we actually, actually come on, on Sundays as well and try and finish up the work because we're suffering in the week as well with the load shedding issues. The Gauteng government will no longer be working with Mosasa. The province has terminated all contracts with the company now known as African Global Group. Premier David Makura says he asked the government, the Gauteng Ethics Advisory Council, for a review of all Mosasa contracts. He's confirmed that the province's social development department has paid 600 million rand to Mosasa over the past 15 years. That's in line with a child justice facility contract held since 2003. Now, the National Department of Correctional Services last month served Bosasa with a 30-day termination notice. A preliminary report suggests the extent of damage caused by floods in Guazul Natal is estimated to be over 100 million rand. Seven people are known to have died. That includes six from Eteguini and a 12-year-old boy from New Hanover. Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs MEC Nomosa Dube Ngube gave an update of the situation following last Sunday's floods. Tuba Vilane was there. These were devastating scenes following the floods last Sunday. Residents were left destitute, some losing all their possessions. Seven people have been confirmed dead. That includes a mother who has been missing since heavy rains hit the province last week. Reports uh, so far estimate to 100 million um, the amount of damage um, to uh, furniture, infrastructure. At least 7,000 houses around Deben have been destroyed. There were also severe damage to infrastructure. Backlog uh, is still very, very significant. We have about 290,000 
informal structures. Uh, we can't do all of them at one time. Government, together with the relief organizations, have been providing assistance to the victims. To Bavilane, Guamashu. Two rival Soweto taxi associations will be compelled to make a public apology to commuters this week. That's according to their mother body, the National Taxi Council. Commuters had to scramble to find transport after six ranks and routes were shut down due to violence. Now, the Wata and Nanduwe associations will also have to commit publicly to peace and safety. Malunga Leboy has a report. Monday is likely to be another struggle for some Soweto commuters. Six routes and ranks remain closed for minibus taxis. As part of an attempt to get the closure lifted, the associations have now agreed to work in line with their operating permits. They've also formed a joint monitoring committee to ensure compliance. No private security guards will be hired at ranks declaring taxi ranks and routes gun-free zones. We have to apportion blame on ourselves first of not being able to can resolve our differences through dialogue. But uh, at the very same time, at the very same time, government should also take a responsibility for having actually registered, you know, same uh, op different operators on the same route without giving them clear parameters onto how to operate. The Water and Nandue associations are expected to make a public apology at a community meeting this week. It is well and proper that we, we stand before the communities. Are you compelling them to do that? Yes, yes, we, 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 we are compelled, we are, we are compelled. Look, these are the people that we serve and we, we did not give them proper service as a result of as getting at each other's throats. The alliance is hopeful that Transport MEC Ishmael Vadi will reopen the routes soon. We are quite optimistic that uh, this could happen within the next week. Operators who go against this closure will be fined 25,000 rand or spent six months in jail. Malungi Lopoi, Johannesburg. After the break, we go live to St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town as a candlelight vigil is being held there this evening in memory of the now 50 people who were shot dead in Christchurch Mosque. Welcome back. The world continues to mourn the now 50 people killed in the Christchurch mosque terror attack. All of the bodies have now been removed from the mosque and the city's Muslim community has urged authorities to quickly release the remains to families for fast burials in adherence with customs. Now St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town is also remembering the victims of the attack. For more on the story, we cross live to our reporter Atim Tongana who is at St. George's Cathedral. Ati, uh, good evening to you. Talk to us about how South Africans are remembering the victims of uh, the Christchurch shooting. Well, Kali, that moment has arrived behind us. Imams from the Western Cape, as well as priests from uh, the Western Cape, have gathered here at uh, uh, St. George's Cathedral to obviously remember the lives of the people that tragically lost their life, lives rather in New Zealand. I'm going to step out of shot, Kali, so you can see exactly what is happening behind me, Kali. Like I said, that moment has finally arrived where you have priests from the St. George's Cathedral as well as some local imams gathering here together with members of the public who have obviously heed the call to come out this evening to mourn and remember the lives of uh, the people that uh, were tragically shot by a suspect uh, believed to be 28 years old and has already been uh, said and actually has self-described to be a uh, white uh, supreme 
extremist. However, Goli, when speaking to some of the people that are standing here, specifically the Muslims, Goli, they were saying to me how they are troubled by the fact that this man has been labeled as a white supremacist and not that of uh, the term of a terrorist, which is often thrown around with uh, regards to uh, attacks that pertain to uh, uh, Muslim people. So right now, Goli, what you're seeing is uh, that 49 minutes vigil uh, that is obviously uh, been put together here to honor the lives of people who died in New Zealand on Friday. Uh, Ati, well, I think for the moment, we're just going to actually uh, keep quiet, you and I, as uh, the moment of silence. I think it's a prayer that's currently going on. Let's just listen in for a bit. Out of love. And you created each and every one of us for love. And you have called us all to love one another as you have loved. And so we stand before you this evening on behalf of those who are pained, those who are grieving, those whose lives have been broken because others have chosen the way of hate rather than the way of love. And we pray along with all those who have chosen the way of love across our international globe. Right, uh, that's uh, the ceremony, a vigil held in Cape Town there in remembrance of uh, the victims of uh, the Christchurch shooting. Let's uh, bring you this story now, a ceremony signifying the burial of Ethiopian nationals killed during last week's plane crash was held today in Addis Ababa's Holy Trinity Cathedral. Family, friends and colleagues arrived to bury the remains of Ethiopian citizens, including the two pilots and six crew members. They died along with 149 passengers in the Ethiopian Airlines crash a week ago. Relatives have been offered charred earth from the crash site to bury since most bodies were destroyed by the impact and fire. Authorities say identifying the small remains collected at the site may take up to six months. The DNA sample collection from relatives is already started and for those relatives who are living abroad we're trying to access them through different uh, branches of uh, uh, the operator. And the victim identification process is expected to take approximately about five to six months. Let's come back home now and uh, Johannesburg's current plastic recycling efforts are falling way off the mark. More than half of the 1.8 million tons of plastic used in South Africa each year is not being recycled. Officials say a lot more needs to be done. Yanke Tome has the details. This is a growing mountain of waste in Johannesburg. In just over three years, there will be no more space left. Recycling can play a key role in addressing this challenge. But are residents recycling, especially when it comes to one of the main culprits, plastic? Some people might separate their waste, while work also takes place at the city's refuse sites. Still, Johannesburg is only meeting 40% of its plastic recycling targets. We are confident that whatever we recycle and whatever recyclers collect ends up in the right space. But we still need to do a lot more than what we're currently doing. Despite recycling being mandatory in over 230 suburbs in Johannesburg at the moment, residents face no consequences if they choose not to do it but the city warns there could be penalties in the future. We don't have penalties in place and we, there's a reason for that. Because the mandatory recycling is not across the city. It's really focused on certain areas only um, at this point in time. And it's only because we had some level of recycling there already. So before we expand, we wanted to be sure that where we do it, we, we can actually um, do it properly. 
The city has also registered over 1,500 informal waste pickers to help them achieve their recycling targets. Young Tome, Johannesburg. After the break, we have your weather details and then she is a civil engineer by day, but by night she is the queen of Icelandic Nur. We meet Iceland's leading crime fiction novelist. Good evening everyone and welcome to the Weather Centre. Tomorrow is going to be another cloudy start to the day for some areas along the western and south coasts. Along with that we are expecting some drizzle for the garden routes and some of the surrounding areas and that could last until late morning. But from lunchtime onwards it will be dry although it stays relatively cloudy for that area. For the rest of the country a few thunder showers over the central and eastern parts in the afternoon and it will be a partly cloudy and hot day for much of the interior. There could also be a few thunderstorms around Portsmouthburg and Kimberley in the northern Cape but aside from that, a generally sunny and very hot day expected for this province. Lots of cloud to start your day off in the Western Cape, especially over the southern parts where we are expecting that light rain for the first half of the day as well. In the Eastern Cape, Port Elizabeth will be partly cloudy and warm at 27 degrees. For the interior, a few isolated thunderstorms have been forecast. There is a 60% chance of thunder showers for the interior of KwaZulu-Natal and it's going to be another hot and sticky day for this province. In Mpumalanga there's also a higher probability of thunder showers, especially for the escarpment areas and that will also include, include Ermelo. And then for Limpopo, while the low felt will be very hot and dry elsewhere over the province, there is a small chance that there could be a few thunder showers developing. Very little changes for the northwest for the start of your work week. Another hot day with partly cloudy weather and perhaps a few thunderstorms. And we are expecting just about the same conditions into the free state with Bloemfontein reaching a maximum of 34 degrees. Temperatures are going to be higher into Gauteng for your Monday, above 30 across the province with a few thunder showers in the area as well. Heading into Tuesday, we're going to see a bit more light rain once again for the garden routes, including George. Thunder showers in the eastern parts where it stays hot and temperatures climb even higher for those areas on Wednesday. And a bit more rain once again along that south coast and spreading towards Port Elizabeth and East London. That's all from the Weather Centre. Goodbye for now. And in our last story, the popularity of the Nordic noir fiction genre shows no signs of slowing down in Iceland. One woman has taken the crime fiction scene by storm with books translated into 30 languages. Can you believe it? Andrea van Veik sat down with her. By day, she's a civil engineer. But by night, she's the queen of Icelandic noir. Isha Sigurdardotter's career began by writing children's books because her son wasn't interested in reading something she considers very important. But she became bored and turned her pen towards crime fiction. So why is Iceland such a great setting for the so-called Nordic noir genre? I think the dark winters have a, have a very, uh, like a good impact on our crime writing. Uh, most crime novels set in Iceland take place in the winter. And I myself, I think I've, I've written now um, uh, 14 crime novels and I think only one is, is based in the summer. Uh, because you just don't associate summer with evil, but you do when it's dark the whole day and so on. But how do you set murder mysteries in a country where the average murder rate is less than one per year? If you make sure that everything else is quite credible, you make the characters believable, the social setting, uh, you describe the landscape, you make everything else very, very credible, then you can get away with having a crime that's a little bit... Um, more smartly executed than, than what we usually have. Her latest book, The Reckoning, is set after a little girl is brutally murdered. Ten years later, a strange revenge letter written by a teenager is found in a time capsule. Soon, the bodies start piling up. Sigurdar Dotter is already writing her next book, hoping it'll be another bestseller. Andrea van Veik, Johannesburg. 
Just before we go, let's remind you of our leading story here on E! News. Picking up the pieces, a preliminary report by local government has put the estimated damage by floods in Guazul Natal at over 100 million rand. For me and the team, it's good night.